Uh, we're going to continue our salvation series and um, look, in, look into the scriptures regarding the mark of true, a true Christian. We're going to look at the second mark this morning. And uh, just briefly, we'll go through the five marks by the way of introduction. Remember uh, the marks of a true Christian. We saw last week the call of a sinner or of the sinner. And then, we saw, uh, then we're going to look at this morning the changed life. And then the following weeks, we'll look at these several ones, the conflict between the flesh and the spirit and the chastening hand of the God and then the comfort of the Father. Turn with me your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. We look at the second mark, the changed life. We're going to look at four things this morning. We're going to look at the foretelling of a changed life, the foundation of a changed life, the fruit of a changed life, and lastly, the faithfulness of a changed life. We're going to look at these four under the second mark this morning, and uh, we'll read 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and then we'll move backward to chapter 5, verse 17, and we'll take our scripture from there. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, notice verse 5, notice what Paul the Apostle says to the Corinthians, he says this, he says, examine yourselves... Whether you be in the faith, he says, prove your own selves, test yourselves, your own selves. Put yourself, he says, to the test, prove your own selves. He makes a statement, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be what? Reprobates, rejected. If you fail the test, what, what does he want us to test? Simple fact, is Jesus Christ living in you? That's the test. That's the test, not whether or not you have a Christian name or you do certain things, not whether or not you hold on to certain traditions or customs of the Christian faith, but rather this, does Jesus Christ live in you? He pours urging these people to examine themselves. He had a concern for the Corinthians. This proves to us that there could be within the church a group of professing believers that are not sure perhaps that they're saved or perhaps struggling, if you will. But here in the context, Paul is challenging them because they were undermining his apostleship. And so he challenged them because the word which they believed on was the word which Paul preached. And it was the gospel. And they were undermining, if you will, Paul the Apostle. And if he says, you're going to undermine me or my apostleship, you're going to undermine the very things that I've been teaching you. And so he says this, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. And the testing is this, after you come under the scrutiny of God's word and the Holy Spirit, does Christ live in you? A second mark of a true Christian is a changed life. Uh, 2 Corinthians, back it up a couple of chapters, chapter 5, look at verse 17. I want you to see something in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Notice what the Apostle Paul mentions here. He says this, he says, Therefore, if any man, being who? Christ. Christ, he is a new creature. If any man, being Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become. What's that word? New. New. Now, there are several terminologies that the Bible speaks about regarding the changed life. And the first one is being a new creature. This is defined as becoming a new person or having a new nature within us. It's God's nature. It's the nature that comes from the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead. And now the new person that uh, he's speaking about or the new creature is in Christ. If you have a look at Galatians 6, have a look at verse 14, behold, he says, but God forbid that I should glory, save in what? The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Look at verse 15, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, or uncircumcision, but what? Why did Paul the Apostle say this? Because he was talking to a group of people that would uh, simply be encouraged to uh, you know, verify their salvation by their outward work. Here we see circumcision was a prominent instruction for the Jews given by God. 
But God is requiring more than just an outward work. He's looking for an inward work, a new creature. Albert Barnes says the fact that a man is created new constitutes the real difference between him and other people. This is what Christ requires. This is the distinction which he designs to make. It's, look, look at this. Look what he says here. It is not by conformity to certain rites and customs that a man is to be accepted. It is not by evaluated or uh, rank or by wealth or beauty or blood. It is not by the color of the complexion. But the grand inquiry is whether a man is in fact a new creature in Christ. Another terminology is being regenerated. This means to be revived from the dead or restored, uh, to be quickened. And we see that used several times by Paul, to be quickened in the spirit. Uh, it means to have a look at a spiritual renovation. And Titus chapter 3 verse 5, But after that the kindness and love of God our Saviour uh, uh, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, look at this, by the washing of regeneration, very important, and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The washing He means to be bathed in, all over. When a sinner trusts Jesus Christ as their saviour, they are cleansed from all their sin by the blood of Christ. Uh, they're made new, regenerated. Now they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. You know, when someone puts their faith in Jesus Christ, what happens on that day in an instant, that the Holy Spirit comes and resides in the believer, and that's nothing to be casual about that's a miracle work of God Amen. it's regeneration Amen. it's a regenerating work of God in a heart if you want to call it we'll look at it a bit later on circumcision of the heart an inward work of God a regeneration John Philip says this in God's sight we are all vile that a complete bath is required the washing of regeneration the agent of that cleansing is the blood of Christ once the washing has taken place, the regeneration can take place. Washing first by the blood of Christ, and then the Holy Spirit of God comes and renews a person, and they're regenerated. C.H. Spurgeon said, a, a supernatural work of the Holy Ghost must be wrought in every one of us, if we would see the face of God with acceptance. Now, thirdly, the terminology here is also, we know, know it as, being born again. In John chapter 3, we see Jesus speaking to a very religious man, very uh, uh, religious man, a man that was trusting in the law and abiding by the law of Moses and so forth. And uh, being born again is known as the second birth or the spiritual birth. That's what being born again is. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, look at this, he cannot enter in or he cannot see the kingdom of God. See what he's saying to Nicodemus? Nicodemus, you must be born again. He's talking to a very religious man. I mean, he's talking to a man that really was following the law to the T, if you will, like Paul the Apostle, a Pharisee, uh, perhaps, and did everything by the law. But listen, there was no inward change. There was no regeneration. There was no new person or new creature that had taken place. It was just all outward. And, 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 and these people in the Old Testament were looking for the Messiah to come to do that operation of the heart. And I, I guarantee you, the people that were living by faith in the Old Testament looking to Christ would be people that would have that spirit of God and be caught up, if you will, together in the air to meet the Lord. There would, the say, it, by the way, the Old Testament saints were never saved by works. It was always by faith, through and through, right from Genesis to Revelation. And Abraham is a perfect example of that. You just have to look, look at James chapter 2. But over here it says in verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? How can this take place? How can, how can that happen? Nicodemus couldn't understand what Jesus is saying. He said, Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb to be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, look at this, Except a man be born of the water and of the, what's that? 
he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And he explains what that means in verse 6. Look, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. A man of God said, you don't manufacture Christians any more than you manufacture babies. The only way to enter into God's family is through the new birth. Amen. Amen. The Christian life cannot be, uh, you know, mimicked. The Christian life uh, cannot be put on in the, in the flesh. The Christian life must be a miracle work of God as soon as a person believes. Yes. On the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's when he explains as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So the son of man must be lifted up. And whoever believes on him. Or calls on the name of the Lord. Will be saved. What does that mean? Uh, Listen. Regenerated. Born again. That's what he's talking about. He's saying to Nicodemus. You want to know how you're going to be born again? You've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. With all thy heart. We see that in the last subject that we touched upon. A man of God said this about George Whitfield, he asked him, why do you always preach that we must be born again? And he replied, because you must be born again. (laughs) Too many religious activities taking place even in the day of George Whitfield. Man being justified by by their own righteousness, it's not going to work. God wants a changed life. God wants the new nature. Now, we're going to look at the first, the foretelling of a changed life. In the Old Testament, it was taught and foretold about this uh, new life in Christ. It wasn't completely foreign to the Jews. It was uh, practically taught, foretold, and fulfilled in the times of Christ. Have a look. The Lord commanded Deuteronomy 10, 16. He says, circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your what? Hearts. And be no more, what's that word? Stiff-necked. You know, you can still do the customs of religion or your tradition and still have a stiff neck toward God. And he's saying to them, a command is that you have to have an inward operation. Outward circumcision is something that man can do, but an inward operation of the circumcision of the heart is what God can do. In reality, what he was talking and, 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 and compelling them to do it was to come to him for the operation. You know, everything that God had done in the Old Testament was pointing to Him, to come to Him, everything. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, we see Christ concealed. And in the New Testament, we see Christ revealed. And it was always pointing to God, to Christ. Now, the Lord declares the New Covenant. Notice Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. With the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put, look at, my law into their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The new covenant that God made with his people would be fulfilled through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. This would be the truth that sets people free from the bondage of sin. That's the truth. That's, that's the law, if you will. Uh, the Bible makes it very clear. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And the reason why the keeping of the law cannot save a sinner is because a sinner is a law breaker. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 5, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Why? Verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law. Look at this, that we might receive the adoption of sons. You know how we are adopted into God's family? By the new birth. By the new creature, the new life, the new nature that we have, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that we are adopted into God's family. And, And that's far more than what the law could do. The law condemns if you try to keep it because we're lawbreakers. If you try to do good or do certain things in the custom of your tradition to earn God's favor, you're only going to be condemned because God is requiring a new birth. And that new birth only comes through Jesus Christ who kept the law perfect, 
sinless, spotless, made under, uh, uh, as a, under the law, kept the law to die for the people that were cursed by the law. This is why we need to be saved. There's a, so, there's a strong inclination in the human being that just always wants to fight to try to earn God's favour. Try to please God in the flesh. Try to do it on their own and God says, no, it can't be done. There's got to be a new covenant and that new covenant was through Jesus Christ. And then the Lord confirms the new heart. Look at Ezekiel 11 verse 19. He says this, and I will give them one heart and I will put, what's that word? A new spirit within you. And I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. They may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. But as for them whose heart walketh uh, after the heart of their uh, detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their heads, saith the Lord. You know, God never desired outward conformity. Never in, in Old Testament, New Testament, God detested outward conformity. God always sought someone that he could actually transform and change by faith alone. It was a longing for God to do a work that they cannot do. It was a longing to seek God and no one else. The second point is the foundation of a changed life. Now, the new birth or the renewing of the whole soul is in righteousness and true holiness. So if a person uh, would end up into heaven, because heaven is a holy place, he cannot enter in apart from Christ because Christ is perfect and pure. And so the foundation is Christ, as we mentioned. If any man be in who? Christ. Please understand, and I'm going to be a, uh, like a parrot here all the way through. There is no changed life apart from Christ. Nothing. If Christ does not live in us and we are not in Christ, then there's nothing to build upon. He is the foundation of our Christian life. Notice what Jesus said or expressed to the disciples. Very sobering statement. And if you only think about it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, notice this. He says this, For I say unto you, accept your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of God. Now think about that for a moment. He's saying to his disciples, except your righteousness exceeds or goes well above the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, there is no way you can enter in the kingdom of heaven. Sobering. Now, the scribes were the ones were, that would copy, if you will, the scriptures. They were doctors of the law. And they would help, if you will, the people understand the law, like Ezra did. He caused them to understand. And they would help them to apply the law. And the Pharisees were separated to keep the law. They, sep they were separated themselves to keep what the scribes taught. And they would be devoted and sacred and separated to that cause. And so when the common people would look at this or hear this statement, think, what in the world exceed the scribes and the Pharisees? Because in that day, the scribes and Pharisees were the, if you will, the example of what holiness looked like. So if anybody were going to heaven, it was the Pharisees. That's how the common people looked at it. I mean, they, look, these guys have just got it all together. These guys are just, wow. What hope do we have? And the Pharisees perhaps will, will be thinking, Exceed our righteousness? I mean, how, what, our righteousness is not good enough. And so this statement would have gave a holy hush on the Sermon on the Mount. You know, just think about that for a moment. Why weren't their righteousness, the religious people, why wasn't it enough? I mean, there weren't, there weren't people going out and drinking. And, and as a matter of fact, the Pharisees detest that. They were calling out sinners for what they were, the publicans and sinners and harlots. They detest uh, uh, things like this. They were, they were very, uh, uh, you know, uh, disgusted by the wickedness of people. So if you looked at them and you thought, wow, these guys are really holy. But why did they fall short? Number one, 
they had the wrong foundation. See, the Pharisees justified themselves on the basis of what they did and didn't do. In other words, they justified themselves by their own works. Look at us. Look at them. Remember, we saw that last week. Have a look at Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, he says this, Paul speaking to the Romans, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear record, I bear them record that they have a what? What's that word? Zeal. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. See, the problem is this. The Pharisees were looking to the law or even to themselves to be justified. They weren't looking to God. Had they looked to God, they would have seen his son. They were looking in themselves. They were looking. It's almost like a Christian saying, oh, you know, I go to church. I pray. I give money. Listen, my friends, I want to remind you, you are not justified by the works that you do. That's, right. That's the wrong foundation. That's right. The wrong foundation. You are not justified by just being here. You have to have a new life. And that's far more than just being in church. And that's far more than just praying and giving. And that's far more than just fasting. That's what the religious people did. The religious rulers will be called someone to be a legalist. You know what a legalist is? It's someone who tries to attain or earn their salvation by their own merit or their own works. They try to justify themselves, listen, by themselves. And then they had the wrong motives, not only the wrong foundation. Some of the things which a religious ruler's practice were done with the wrong motives. They fasted and prayed and gave, look, to appear righteous, not before God, but before men. The Bible mentions here in Matthew chapter 23, verse 28, Jesus speaking to them, said, even so ye also outwardly appear, what's that word? What's that word? Righteous unto men, but within you are full of, what's that word? And you're not clean. You're living a double life. You're full of sin. Listen, you know what Jesus was saying? You're just putting on a show. You're putting a show for others. And the indictment today is that people are trying to justify themselves before men, but they're not justified before God. Can I just say something to you? Being justified before God is more important than men. James chapter 2 talks about being justified before men. That needs to exist, yes. but being justified before God must come first. Yes. They had the wrong motives. They did certain works to justify themselves before men. Look at, verse, look at Luke 16, uh, verse 15. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before who? Men. But God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Whatever show the Pharisees put on, in front of people, cause the people to say, oh, wow. But in God, he's saying, abomination, disgusting. Now think about that for a moment. Think about that. Why? Because they weren't regenerated. Their heart was uh, defiled. It was dirty. And so no matter what they did, it wasn't good enough to come before God because it wasn't done out of faith. It was done out of works and it was for their own praise. They loved, they, they loved the praise of men more than God. And then they had the right, wrong priorities. The Pharisees were more concerned with looking the part, listen, than being the part. You know, that's bondage. You know, that's absolutely bondage when you're more consumed about looking the part than being the part. That's bondage. And the Pharisees, Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, look what Jesus says to them. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. He says, for ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Outwardly, they're doing well. In another passage, he says, you are uh, whited sepulchres. From outside, you're white and pure. But he says, from inside, you are like dead men's bones. 
because they were more concerned about the outward appearance than the inward appearance, uh, the inward change or the inward work of God. He goes on to say in verse 26, Thou blind Pharisees, cleansed second. Did he say that? No. Cleanse first. Sometimes I just say that to see if you're with me. Because if I say second and you say amen, you're not with me. <laughs> All right. Cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, and that the, old, that, the out, that the outside of them may be clean also. So you know what? Even though they had an outward disposition of cleanliness, God never saw it as cleanliness. It wasn't truly clean. It was put on and mimicked and it was counterfeited for, the, for wrong motives. And said, he said, if you get the right, if you get the inward part right, then the outward will follow. You know, Jesus is not undermining outward, outward appearance. I mean, we, we, we don't live in a day, or we shouldn't live in a day where we say we're saved and we're born again, we're going to heaven and continue to live like we're not saved. Right? Jesus is not advocating for that. But he's just saying you need to get first things first. They had it backwards. The Pharisees had it backwards. <clears throat> and to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is to have, listen, the righteousness of Christ. God is looking for someone that he can get a hold of and do a miracle work in. Not someone that's trying to get a hold of God by their own works. God is trying to get someone just to be trusting in him and surrendered. And God, when he has that person he can transform them and start making them. Well, it's a beautiful thing. It's a miracle work. It's a work of God, and that's what we want. Number three, we want to see the fruit of a changed life. The fruit. One of the greatest fruit of a changed life is someone who has truly repented. Someone that has truly turned to God. Have a look at Luke chapter 3, verse 8. Notice what John the Baptist said. He says, bring forth therefore, what's that word? Fruits. Fruits worthy of repentance. He says, and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up the children unto Abraham. You know what he's saying? He's saying there ought to be some fruit. There ought to see, be some evidence for a heart that is truly repentant toward God. It's not enough to say we are from the descendant or the seed of Abraham. It's not enough to say that. Oh, we, we have the faith of Abraham because we are from his seed. No, you need to have your own faith. You need to exercise faith in Jesus Christ. And when you do that, that has a repentant heart toward God. It brings you to God. It doesn't take you away from God. And there ought to be some fruit there to prove that you have turned to God. It's not enough. Listen, people, it's not enough just to say, I'm a Christian. I was brought up in a Christian home and I had Christian parents. Listen, are their faith, is, is, uh, is their faith your faith? You, you have to have your own faith in Jesus Christ. You have to turn to God. You have to repent and trust the Lord Jesus as your Savior. He asked me uh, back in the day before I was a true born blood bought believer, if I was a Christian, I would have said to you, yes, absolutely, hands down. I'm a Christian. As a matter of fact, I've got a cross here and I have the face of Jesus here tattooed before I was a Christian. And by the way, tattoos are not good. They were before I was a Christian. So who, who said so? Levi go, go to Levi Leviticus. And you'll see that it was always wrong to mark your body. But my, my thing is this, if you ask me if I was a Christian, I said, absolutely, I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm a Christian. But I wasn't. Because I was not changed. My heart wasn't changed. There was no work done in my life. It was full of what the Pharisees were full of, excess and extortion and bitterness and hate and envy. It was not, the love of God wasn't shed abroad in my heart. I wasn't circumcised in the heart. What I knew here didn't hit home until 15, 16 years ago. And what a night that was. 
Oh, what a night. Got right with God. And I'll tell you, something happened. Oh, something happened. Oh, that day. I was saved. Amen. I was born again. Yeah, glory. A lot of people want to remember their first birth. But I remembered my second birth. And I'm not saying that you have to remember, but I did. Because that was a, that was a work of God that I'll never forget. Amen. Never in my life. I got right with God. That, that day a miracle happened in my life. I can't explain it to you. I can't tell you. But I, I could say this. Man, I wasn't enmity with God anymore. I made peace with God and I knew it. And there was a work in my heart. And one of the greatest fruit of a changed life is when someone truly comes and turns to God and that can't be indifferent. For them, it was baptism. They came, the Bible says, confessing their sins, believing on God. They knew it when they got right with God. You do a word study. Do a word study on believed. And when they believed, and when they, you look, look, see it over and over again. And when they believed from uh, the Lord Jesus is coming. And, uh, and, and his coming is sooner from when you've believed. And so there had to be a time where you repented and trusted Christ. And that's the day you st- the, the, the operation starts. The changed life. And God is not looking for a mere profession, but rather a heart that is genuine. Listen, and genuine repentance produces fruit. Amen, it's true. Being a descendant of Abraham is not going to do it. Knowing that... Being a, in the Christian heritage won't do it. You must be born again. People brought up doing what their tradition expects them to do is not what makes a new creature. A change of habits is not merely a change of heart. Get it. Get it. Somebody converts from Muslim to Catholic because they want to marry the person. Or someone converts from Muslim to Christianity, if you want, if you will, because they just want to. It's it's a it's an obligation if for uh, that person to marry that person. But what happens? They haven't believed. They're just changing over to marry. They're not changing over because they see their wicked sin and they're repenting and they have fruits unto worthy on the. Their 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 motives is marred. It's it, it's distorted. So are they a Christian? No. Are they saved, born again? No. There's no proof of that person truly repenting. They just changed over to marry somebody. And sometimes that happens. Well, if I have to be like that person to marry them, I'll do it. If I have to act a certain way to marry that person, I'll do it. But God is not looking for those kind of professions God is looking for a profession that comes to him with brokenness over their sin and a mourning. And that's fruit. That's fruit worthy of repentance. Lord, we saw it. We can't bypass the call of a sinner. It has to take place. And when it takes place, listen, there's fruit to prove their call. There's fruit. Notice what Peter said in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. He says, repent ye therefore and be converted. That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Repent and be converted. Turn around to God that what? Your sins will be wiped clean. Gone. (laughs) I love, I like that. Clean. New, new, not just a new slate. Listen, a new heart. It's not enough just to have a new leaf turn over. I'm just going to turn another leaf. No, you can turn the leaf over and over again, my friend. If you don't have a new heart, you're done. You're done. And I'm afraid people do that. Just turn another leaf, turn another leaf, turn another surround, another surround. But there's no operation in their heart. Nothing's take place. It's dead. And God wants us to revive us and, 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 and quicken us in the spirit of God because we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are dead. And when you made alive, oh, it's a beautiful thing. Yes. Now, when a person has new life in Christ, look at, look at this. There is an adamant, new, growing desire to walk in the ways of God. Number one, there's a growing hatred for sin. Whosoever is, what's that word there? Born of God. Born again. New nature. Changed person. Whosoever is born of God 
doth not commit sin. For his seed, that's the Holy Spirit, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. There's a hatred, a growing hatred toward sin. Someone that's born again doesn't want to live in sin. They detest it because they're born again. The Holy Spirit of God is that, does that work uh, in that person's life. And then there's a growing love, if you will, for God's people. Have a look at 1 John 3. For we know that we have, what's that word? Past. Follow with me. For we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in what? Death. Whoso hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know, I mean, you know, common sense, that no murderer, someone that hates their brother, have eternal life abiding in them. There's a growing love for the saints of God. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is what? Born of God and knoweth God. And then there's a growing love for the Lord. 1 John chapter 5, look at this. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the, is, is the Christ is what? Born of God. And everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also, that is begotten of him. Look at this. By this we know that we love the children of God. How? When we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. How do you know that you have love toward your brother? Because you have love toward God. You cannot hate your brother and claim that you love God. How does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. And the Bible says that his commandments are not grievous for us, so grievous unto us. So if we love God and we want to keep that golden commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves and our brother and love them, I have a growing love for God. Listen, that is a mark of someone that is born again. That's a mark of someone that's born again. Now I'm just reading the scriptures. That's all I'm doing. I'm just pointing to what... And by the way... That's what God did in my life. Amen. I started loving people that I met across the uh, world and I didn't even know them. But I knew that they testified about Jesus and we got on like this. I think the same spirit of God that dwells in me dwells in them. I've, uh, he's become someone that I've known for a hundred years now. And I'm saying this to you, but there are other Christians that profess Christ that don't speak the same spiritual lingo. I'm like, oh, that's a bit different. But there are some people that I can meet across the world and they have the seed of God in them and mate, there's something that just yes. unites us together. Yes. And that's the children of God, my friend. It's not put on. It's not mimicked. They believe the Bible. Yes. They love the word of God. And they desire to do it. And man, how that's a sweet kind of fellowship. Mm. And, uh, and then have a look. It's not only a growing love for the Lord, but it's a growing separation from the world. 1 John 5 verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is, that, who is that that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God, the Redeemer, the Messiah, the one that's come to redeem us and save us from our sin. It's not just an a, 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 you know, intellect a, a confirmation. It's more than that. It's embracing everything that the Son of God is. And I've trusted him. And he has given us the spirit of God uh, by faith that we can overcome, get the victory over the world. And we can say, no, I'm not going to do that. And no, I'm not going to go there. And no, I'm not going to. Well, who does that? The work of God in a person's life because he's born of God. And it's a growing process. It doesn't happen overnight. We're going to see that in the next session. The conflict between the spirit and the flesh and the raging battle that takes place. We're not saying that Christians are perfect uh, by all means. And we're not saying that Christians cannot backslide. We're going to see that in the fourth session. But let's keep it in context. What takes place? There's a growing desire from God to detest and hate the things of this world. I don't stand with the world, I stand with God. As a matter of fact, if I stand with the philosophy of the world, I become an enemy of God. I stand with God and with God's people that live by faith. 
And then I want to give you some examples, if you will, of a changed life. But look what Paul said before we go there. Galatians 6.14, I love what he says here. And we, we, we addressed this in the beginning of the sermon. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I am the world. You know what Paul's saying? Because of the cross of Jesus Christ, I am dead to the world, and the, de- and the world is dead to me. I'm done with it. I'm done with the world. I'm done with Hollywood. I'm done with everything that is against God and ungodly. I'm done with unrighteousness. I'm done with ungodliness. I am someone born again that wants to please God by faith. And God does that work in my life. He teaches me and orders my steps in that way. Especially when you first become born again like a little baby. You don't know how to walk properly. Uh, But he helps you walk. And he helps you grow. And I hope you are growing Christian Amen. because it will, be, it, will be, it will be so hilarious and funny to you that if I stood here today and, and just continued to suck on a dummy as a 40-year-old man, and, and, and it would be funny, right? Is there anything taking place in your life that God is developing you and making you like Christ? Is there a work of God in your heart? Well, there's no growth, me profession, in and out of church, Bundy on, Bundy off, to the next week, did your duty, but there's no heart for God. I mean, this is why we're doing this series, so you can examine yourself whether you have the mark of a changed life, that God is doing an operation and working in your heart to make you like the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's just more than just a profession. There's fruits worthy, worthy of repentance. Now, I want to give you some examples now. Zacchaeus is a perfect example of this. Have a look at Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Luke chapter 19. Turn your Bibles with me. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. I love this example by Zacchaeus. I'm thinking about naming one of them. The Lord gives me another boy, Zacchaeus. You say, why? Because he demonstrated, he demonstrated pure faith in Jesus Christ. Man, if there was any kind of demonstration of, of, of you know, uh, repentance that is worthy, uh, it was Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19, look at verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And there, behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And notice, first of all, he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was a little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when he saw, and when Jesus came to the the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, don't don't you just love the fact that God knows you by name? And maybe it is just right here this morning. And the the sound of this preaching, God will just say and call out your name. And would you respond if God is calling out your name? Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. He made haste and came down and received, what's that word? He what? He received him joyfully. That's a good indication that he was receiving Christ and not rejecting. He received him joyfully. And when they saw it, who the the Pharisees, they all murmured, saying, that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto him, Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I will restore him fourfold. It blew Jesus away. Look at verse 9. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham, what's this, by faith, not by descendant, by faith, not by seed perhaps. Look at this. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. God is looking for pure faith that works pure repentance. And here Zacchaeus demonstrated a heart of repentance. His desire, his great desire to make things right proved it. He just wanted to make things right. That's the work of God, by the way. When you receive Jesus, they that gladly received his word. When you receive Jesus and you acknowledge him as your 
sin bearer and saviour. There's a work that takes place in a person's heart. And it's the born again, regenerated experience. Who told him to restore the goods? Who told him? Something inside called the Holy Spirit of God. Told him, get right. And he said, yes. And Jesus said, salvation's come to you. I can see salvation's come. Wow. Yep. Fruit. Fruit, pure fruit, if you will. Uh, to prove his faith. Look at, look at the church at Thessalonica. Thessalonica. Look at this. First Thessalonians 1.9. For they themselves, look at this, show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. How that ye what? Turned to God from what? Idols to serve the living and true God. See that? There was a turning away of those dead and dumb idols to turn to Christ, the true living God. Look at the believers in Ephesus, Acts chapter 19. And many that believed came, confessed. And what they do? Showed their deeds. Repentance. And many of them also, which used curious arts, bought their books together and burned and, and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them that found it 50,000 pieces of silver. You want to know a true believer? You want to see the mark? Right there. Right there. Curious arts, dabbling with perhaps sorcery and, and different things of that nature and, and things that are against God. By the way, I'm going to say it again. Just say if you didn't understand me. Hollywood is against God. I didn't have to be, uh, you know, well established in the faith before I knew that God wanted me to get rid of ungodly, wicked things. And when you hear preaching and the Holy Spirit of God works in your heart, you say, I'm done with it. You know, it's like burning these books. I'm done. It's gone. It's rubbish. Who does that work? Now, it's a work done because God's working in my heart. I'm not doing it to get to heaven. There's a big difference, okay? I know what I'm struggling through. And by the way, music and Hollywood were the two major things that I struggled with. It wasn't drugs and alcohol. I, I kicked that to the side by the grace of God the first couple of months in my Christianity. The things that I struggled with was these two. But I knew I was struggling with them. It was the battle between the spirit and the flesh. And the spirit of God was working. And I, I'm so glad he got the victory. I'm so glad that he got the victory. And I can kick it aside and say, I'm done with it. You know what, 50,000 50, pieces of silver, you know, what's the equivalent? You know how much they burnt? Someone once said it was like 150 people working uh, per year. 150 people for one year wages. 150 people. Now compare 50,000 pieces of silver with 20 pieces of silver. Big difference? Well, that's how much Judas used to betray the Lord Jesus. So can you imagine a true repentant heart? 50,000? It's nothing. It's like, it's this. I mean, who does that? Where's that from? It has to be a work of, of God, an operation. I mean, do you understand that we could sell these 50,000? We don't have to work for 50, 150 year, uh, years. I mean, for, I mean, that's what they said. The equivalent amount to these books were, and it's an substantial amount, but they just burnt them away. And that's the fruit of repentance. I see it. I see that's fruit. That's right before us. I think God will demonstrate it to us that that's how it looks like. Many believed, came, confessed, showed their deeds. Showed their deeds. And then lastly, the faithfulness of a changed life. The evidence of a professing believer becoming a new person in Christ, listen, is a continued, renewed walk. Yes. It's continued. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so ye walk in 
Him. Spurgeon said, Sanctification is the great open separator of Christians from the world. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives within us and we live in the Spirit of God, let us walk in the Spirit. If we receive Christ, let's walk in Him. So in other words is this, the instruction given to us that this call of a sinner doesn't end there. Once you're saved, you're changed and you have a continued desire to follow the Lord Jesus. And He continues to make you and mould you and, and sanctify you. Far more than what the law can do. Far more than what the self-righteousness in your own life can do. This is why Jesus said, Except your righteousness exceed that of the righteousness of the Pharisees, you shall, know, uh, you, sh you shall not enter, in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. What's he saying? There needs to be a continued miracle work in your life. And uh, we see that. Look, at, look in John chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus said to these Jews, which what? Believe. They believed on him. Yeah. If you continue in my word, then ye are my disciples. What's that word? Indeed. Indeed. And continued in what? In church. No. no. In giving. No. In the word of God. Amen. Because he, John chapter 17 says, Sanctify them by thy truth, for thy word is truth. And God continues to sanctify you, to make you like Christ. In every sense of the word. Inward work, outward work. A genuine believer holds fast, obeys, practices the word of God. They follow through. They are practically sanctified by the word of truth. Look at John chapter 8 verse 32. He continues to say, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed. And we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, that ye, uh, ye shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commit a sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever. But the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So what, what, what's this continued life? Continued in the word of God and free from sin. Amen. Servants to God and away with sin. I'm no longer living in sin. I'm not a bondage or a servant to sin. I'm a servant to Jesus Christ. Amen. Which is the fruit of holiness and righteousness until eternal life. This is what he says to the Romans. And this is where the Lord takes us and leads us to. He says, they said, we've been free again. Because you know, because you know Abraham? It's not enough. You know, I'll just even say this. Can I just say this? Because they were just so zealous about Abraham and their fathers and so forth. If you know this book back to front, if you know this book back to front and you know all the stories and you're not free from sin and you don't continue in the book, then there's no way in the world you're going to enter into heaven. You know how many people I've met on the street and they've said, oh, I've read the Bible several times. So are you continuing it? No. Oh, yeah, yeah no, I've, I've been to Sunday school. I've heard the stories and all, all but how come you're not continuing? Yeah. And some people will, will confess that they're Christians. But if they're not continuing in the word that sanctifies them, that that. Puts the sin, God, you know, folks, you know, sanctif being sanctified and free from sin is important. And if you have made a profession and said a prayer somewhere in your life and you are still living in your old sins for 10, 20, 30 years, something's got to be right. Wrong, uh, wrong. Can I just say this to you? Can I just say this? We don't believe in sinless perfection, but we believe in the saints perfected. Did you get it? We don't believe that when someone gets saved, they're going to become perfect and they're never going to sin. But we believe the saint is perfected. 
Are you being perfected? Is God working in your heart by the word of God, by the word of truth? I think that's very important to understand that. Have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're almost done. Have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 9. First Corinthians 6, look at verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't you understand that the unrighteous person will not... You can say the sinner's prayer 1,500 times. But if you're still unrighteous and you're not living in the righteousness of Christ and God working in your heart, it doesn't matter. You can be the seed of Abraham all you want. But if you don't have a changed life, my friend, it's for nothing. Be not deceived. You know what he's saying? Don't live in deception. Listen, fornicators will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Idolaters, adulteresses, or infeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind. By the way, gays are not getting to heaven. They, they need to repent. Amen. We're living in a very sloppy Christianity today. Very sloppy. Nor thieves. Still trading on your tax as a Christian? You know, there's Christians that don't care about cheating on their tax. That, you ought to care. You ought to care. Nor covetous. You're still desiring the things that don't belong to you or you're getting victory. Nor drunkards. You're still on the bottle. Christians, they say, oh, I'm saved. <coughs> Are you saved? Yeah. Jesus made wine. Different Christianity. I, I don't know about that Christianity. That they can still tr drink. They're on the bottle. And they're still drinking. And they, and they get tipsy every now and then. Nor revelers. Nor extortioners. That was Zacchaeus. Remember? Zacchaeus was a standover man. Yeah. Ripping people off. Shall inherit the kingdom of God. You think these kind of people are going to get to heaven? No. But look at this, verse 11. Amen. And such, what's that word? Were That's right. some of you. That's right. I love that conjunction. Yeah. But here, yeah, washed. By what? The regeneration. Sanctified. Justified. In who? In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Are you born again? Yeah. Are you born again? Or are you banking on a mere profession one day that you said that didn't even save a dead fly? I'm telling you. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. And prove your own selves. I will not be deceived by the culture of Christianity today by a mere zeal of God. I look at that and they... Jumping up and down, worshipping Jesus, and that's zeal, and I'm done with it. It will not move me far away from this book. I believe the book more than human experiences. Yes. I would not be deceived and say, well, the marks of a true Christian is zeal for God. No. No. The marks of a true Christian is a changed life. In Jesus Christ Amen. and by the Holy Spirit. Folks, the Holy Spirit hasn't become trendy. Amen. It's still holy. Ah, uh, Someone says, I'm a Christian. They're still living and getting tattoos and drinking. and go they go to, They're going to the pub for their fellowship youth group night. I'm thinking, how does that work? Now, it would work if I was the professing believer for 24 years of my life. I could, I'd say, I'd love to go. I mean, this is good Christianity. It fits my lifestyle. But the new man in Christ says, what is that? Nah, that does, and if I go because I'm a babe in Christ, I'll be, perhaps the Holy Spirit will get my hand to go up like this and go, something's wrong here. 
I got saved out of that. What am I doing here? And God moves me along, moves me along. Praise God for the Holy Spirit that works in my heart and mind. I used to bounce as a, as a babe in Christ. Still got some time. As a babe in Christ, my friend gave me gospel rap. Gospel rap. You've heard of gospel rap? Jesus, the only way. There, uh, there's no other way. John 14, 6. I thought, wow, this is great. I can enjoy Christianity and still bounce. You know, to, but you think about rap, right? What does that associate with? Gangsters, murders, this, that. And so when I was bouncing one day in the car... My hand went up again and went, "Mm, still something's not right here. I'm serious. I was trying to enjoy it, but I couldn't because I knew it was satisfying the flesh. Had nothing to do with worshipping God. There probably is still element of truth there that I just, man, I I couldn't believe the lyrics. I was still that babe in Christ that you said Jesus is the only way. I'd say amen because I loved Mary and I loved the saints. And so that was my little you know, if you will, revival theme and preaching for that era. But as I grew in the Lord and read the book and saw, oh, I can't listen to this music anymore. Got to kick it to the side. When I started going to church and hearing hymns like this, I thought, man, this is a bit foreign. I've never heard this before in my life. It's not that I didn't like it. It was different. And they say music is neutral. Then how come they're not playing the hymns in the pub? How come they're not playing this kind of music in the shopping centers? It's neutral, right? We want to bring the music of the world in the church, but the, the, let's put on a few hymns in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the Westfields and see what they do. It's not neutral, my friend. No, this music here is holy under God. It's not neutral. You just want to get a little groove on for the goats in the church so you can keep it in, but no one said keep goats in the church. We ought to be saintly and lights. And it's a work of God in our hearts. May God help us in these last days. May God help us. I want to use one more passage here. Luke chapter 7. Have a look at Luke chapter 7. I want want to just show you one more example. The difference... Between a sinner that's saved and a believer that is not regenerated. Luke chapter 7, look at verse 36. And we're done after this. One of the Pharisees desired him, which Jesus, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat to meet. Behold, the woman... And the city, which was a what? Sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in in the Pharisee's house, bought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet and behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And when the Pharisee, which was bidden, Him saw him, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is uh, that toucheth him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answering and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, And he says, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? And Simon answered and said, I suppose he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman, and he said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered in thy house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, But this woman, since the time I came in, have not ceased to kiss my feet, my head with oil. Thou didst not anoint, but the woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she, what's that word? Love much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. You know what the problem was with Simon? 
problem was is that he was blinded by his self-righteousness. You know what the uh, good problem with this, with this lady? That she can actually see her sin for what it is. But she can also see the Savior for who he is. And what did it do? It brought her to repentance. And the proof of that is this worship, extra, extravagant worship to God, an ex- extraordinary love and adoration to Him. Why are we any different? Do you love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength? Do you have a growing love for the Lord? I mean, do you hear it, Simon, you religious man? You hear it? And all you can think about, who's this woman touching him? Well, if anyone can touch Jesus, it's Simon. I mean, I'm a good person. Well, maybe when you compare yourself to others, but when you compare to yourself to a holy God, You can only see and say, Lord, I must be born again. I am vile. I am wretched. I need the Lord. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Take the world. Give me Jesus. But that's when you see your sin for what it is. That's when you see Christ for who he is. And then he goes on and he says, you know, man, your sins are forgiven. Go, make your way. A love for God, love for Jesus, a love for the Savior. And this way, worshipping God in a very extravagant way is proof of a changed life. Is proof of someone believing on the Lord. And Jesus affirms it. Your sins are forgiven. You're washed and sanctified and justified. What a testimony. Amen. When I read of this woman, I think, what a testimony. You just have to go and realize, you know, alabaster box, they say it's like a one year wages. Round about one year wages. Gone on the Lord. Remember? Uh, Judas couldn't handle the fact that the alabap- alabaster box was broken on the Lord. He said, we could have given this to the poor. But you know, you can't be indifferent when you've met Jesus. When he changes your life, he has you. You think you care about these tangible things? He says, Lord, take my life and let it be. Consecrated all to thee. That's where you end up, my friend. That's where you end up. You continue in the word and you continue to say, I'm done with it. A changed life, being born again, being regenerated. God working in you far more than what you can do. Accept your righteousness. Exceed the righteousness of the Pharisee. You will in no wise enter in the kingdom of heaven. Examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Put yourselves to the test. Is Christ in you? Unless you be rejected at the day of judgment. That will be a terrible thing. Examine. See. And if he's not, call Call on the Lord with all your heart. And be saved and regenerated and born. If any man, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Amen. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become Amen. new. Amen. Let's pray.